Matthew Spriggs is an Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow working on the project The Collective Biography of Archaeology in the Pacific, CBAP. Um, he's also the Professor of Archaeology in the School of Archaeology and Anthropology at the Australian National University. He's undertaken extensive archaeological research in the Pacific Islands and island Southeast Asia for over 40 years, particularly in Vanuatu. His laureate project is concerned with the history of Pacific archaeology. And it's been a pleasure. I'm Adam Nelson. I'm the head of education um, at the Hearst Museum. And it's been a pleasure working with Matthew on, um, on selecting and doing the interpretation of a handful of sherds that are now on display in our gallery. So come and have a look. Uh, we just um, unveiled that case the other day. So if you haven't had a look, um, check it out. So, um, and it's exciting to have the, these objects and these stories in the gallery in our lounge of wondrous anthropological discoveries. So um, yeah, so I think without further ado, I'll turn it over to Matthew. Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> right, um, I gave a seminar here in 2015 actually, and um, that was just as the project was starting. And uh, I talked about what the aims of it were. So if you were at that one, uh, you'll have seen some of these, although perhaps in a longer form. Um, just to sort of really reiterate what the, the aims were, um, really that there isn't much on the history of Pacific archaeology. And the most accessible thing is Pat Kirch's chapter in his, uh, in his textbook on the road of the winds. And that's basically it. There's a few. Um, kind of national histories, particularly from New Zealand and Australia, there's been quite a lot on the history of archaeology, but on the Pacific Islands, amazingly little. So we thought this was time to, um, to change this. Um, and part of it came from a desire to kind of critique really our current understandings of Pacific archaeology, not least because I remember picking up a, some article, I think it was written in 1914, and it had pretty much everything that we kind of you read in standard textbooks today, it was already there, including Austronesians, you know, it kind of mentioned the whole thing. So that, that's rather alarming, I, fi I find, you know, have we wasted a hundred years where we didn't have to do anything at all? Um, so that's part of the idea. And also, you know, histories of, I know histories of sociocultural anthropology, which rely a lot on Pacific materials, they, they've kind of created that, that history by excising the fact that a lot of these early people who are now called anthropologists, of course they were ethnologists at the time, they were as much the ancestors of archaeology as they are of sociocultural um, anthropology. People like um, Alfred Court Haddon, for instance, much of his work was on material culture, but his 1898 Torres Strait expedition is always seen as the kind of one of the, the birthplaces of, uh, of modern sociocultural anthropology. Even Malinowski once published an article on stone axes. It wasn't very good, but you know, at least he made the attempt. Um, so the history, the early history of archaeology and anthropology in the Pacific, these are very much intertwined, and yet that you won't get that impression from reading particularly histories of British social anthropology, which are um, very strange things. Also, um, Although there's been quite a lot of work on the history of Australian archaeology, it's very much, and the New Zealand material is the same, it's just about people in Australia and New Zealand, as if they didn't have wider connections with the outside world. And in fact they did, and many of the figures who are quite important in the history of Australian archaeology, people like Fred McCarthy, who was a curator at the Australian Museum in Sydney, and uh, Norman Tyndale in South Australia also worked in the Pacific and or Southeast Asia as well. Um, also, I didn't want this to be the dead white Anglo-Saxon male history of archaeology in the Pacific. So the two postdocs that I recruited, one is a francophone and the other is a, if there is such a word, a Germanophone. I don't know what the word for a, a German speaker is. Anyway, and particularly French uh, uh, archaeology in the Pacific up until the present day is very strong. And the Germans made a lot of interesting, um, mainly pre-World War I contributions, i.e. before they were kicked out of the Pacific at the Treaty of Versailles. Um, so, so some important stuff. Also, and this is something, I don't know if it's in Pat Coach's latest version of his On the Road to the Winds, but the original version, 
He suggested that outside of New Zealand, the number of excavations done before World War II in the Pacific could be numbered on the fingers of one hand. Now, that's complete rubbish. There were lots of excavations and they were done, some of them were as good as excavations anywhere else in the world at the time. So I wanted to kind of bring these back into, into focus. Um, also, um, one problem that we have is that quite often the artifacts and the field notes are in separate institutions or they have the artifacts in a museum but they have no documentation about them. So we, part of the aim too is to try and sort of find where these archives were. Um, the immediate result of that was that we found there was in fact an enormous body of material because no one had really looked for it. You know, we had no idea how much there was, but there is a real, there are archives all over the world about this stuff. Um, just as a notable example, um, Catherine Routledge, who was an early um, archaeologist, worked on, on uh, Rapa Nui, Easter Island, and her field notes are in the Royal Geographical Society in London, and the artifacts are in the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford. So <laughs> it's this kind of stuff, happens all the time. Um, also, I want to look at this perennial issue, it kind of every few years it comes up again, of transoceanic contacts, particularly contacts between South America and, and the Pacific, and also to try and understand why they've been so persistent and uh, what we might get out of knowing about them, what it might tell us about wider ideas about the Pacific. And I have a PhD student um, who's just finishing up her PhD on that very topic. And uh, she's um, uh, a Mexican citizen. And uh, so she's been able to bring together all the Spanish language material, which may be more accessible to people in the US, but is not very accessible to people. <laughs> we don't have many Spanish speakers in Australia. Um, so that's going to be a very interesting uh, thing. We also wanted to redress and neglect to the role of women archaeologists. And I'm very pleased to say that my postdoc, Emily Dot Saru, has now got another postdoc or another fellowship um, to concentrate on that for the next four years after the project finishes at the end of uh, this month. Um, and we have done a bit with the project uh, so far, but again, there's a lot more um, material. There are um, women who were identifiably archaeologists I, in their own right. And then, of course, there's, uh, and this will come up again in relation to Edward Gifford from this very university. Um, often they went on expeditions with their wives and uh, who were doubtless doing a lot of the work but are sort of never mentioned and, and barely get into the books. In fact, the only time that Delilah Gifford got her name on an Edward Gifford monograph about his work, even though she accompanied him on almost every expedition, was after he died and she ended up editing the monograph on Yap. That's one of your series here. It's the only one that her name appears on even though she was there and obviously doing stuff in lots of them. So we're, we're trying to recover some of that. And also, um, I don't know why the N agency is, there must have been some word I left out, uh, just the Agency Contribution of Indigenous Scholars and Interlocutors. And this is um, very largely the subject of what I'll be talking about today. Okay, just a couple, um, because there, um, a lot of them have just come out, there's a, a few references which, if you're interested, are certainly worth um, having a look at. The whole sort of rationale of the project uh, can be found in the 2017 paper I wrote in the Bulletin of the History of Archaeology, which is an open access journal. Um, also available for free download in a book on Archaeologies of Island Melanesia. Um, I tried to put together a different way of looking at the history of, of really Pacific archaeological practice, but particularly Melanesia which is to look at the technologies available to archaeologists at different times. Like, you know, you can't really get a, a, an absolute chronology until you've got radiocarbon dating. So what was the effect of that? When did it come in? When did people start using it? And a whole range of archaeological techniques, such as petrographic thin sections of axes and pottery and other stuff. When these come in, it, they're kind of game changers in terms of what archaeologists can even talk about. Exchange, for instance couldn't be talked about much before then. Um, particularly in relation to what I'm talking about today, um, uh, in Journal of Pacific History, not sadly not an open access journal, but I'm sure your library has it, um, I, I did particularly write about indigenous agency and, 
in Gifford's Fijian Archaeological Expedition of 1947. Um, and that came out last year. And then an article which I'm very proud about, um, which came out the day before yesterday. Um, in the Bulletin of History of Archaeology again, um, not really relevant to what I'm talking about today, but it fits in with the, it came out of the, the idea to make the history of Australian archaeology take note of the fact that Australians were also working in other places, in the Pacific for instance. However, it morphed into a, a basically realising that the whole history of Australian archaeology is a lie. Um, the standard history of Australian archaeology begins in January 1956 when John Mulvaney starts excavating at Fromm's Landing. And everyone before that was a horrible sort of racist, uh, you know, pot hunter. Well, they didn't have pots, but you know what I mean, an artifact collector and, uh, you yeah, know, just wandering around kind of at random. This is so not the case. You know, there was really good archaeology being done in Australia long before John Mulvaney came on the scene. Uh, um, and certainly in the 1940s, there was excellent work, as good as work being done anywhere in the world being done, um, particularly looking at trying to get at issues such as when was Australia first settled by humans? Uh, and in the absence of radiocarbon dating in a place like Australia, it was a pretty, uh, pretty difficult subject to address, but people were doing great work. So um, again, I think that's uh, gonna, it's certainly gonna annoy a lot of people in Australia, which is great. Okay, um, my project very sadly is coming to an end soon, the end of this month. Um, but we're ending with a Histories of Archaeology conference um, and uh, 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 really there we're, part of the idea is to bring in um, some of the sort of heavy hitters in the history of archaeology, Nathan Schlanger, Margarita Diaz Andreu, Oscar Moro Abadia, uh, Tim Murray, other people and to try and get a bit more of a theoretical reflection on, on our work that we've done working on the project in the Pacific. Because I think that where we've been weakest really is in relating our work to the wider sort of histories of archaeology that are being done in the world. Um, I think partly just because we became kind of overwhelmed with the amount of new material that is available. So just like documenting that there have been all these excavations which had happened in the Pacific from the 1870s onwards um, was kind of tough enough without having to, without, without kind of getting heavily involved in some of the theoretical debates. Um, so we're hoping, hoping to sort of uh, get a bit of a boost um, and, you know, get our, pull our theoretical socks up um, with some of the contributions from that conference. Also, we're running a workshop for Pacific Island Museum and Archive people to really let them know what the, the project has done, what resources we have. And uh, we have um, ongoing collaborations with several of these museums. And really, it's to sort of look at new collaborations or things where we can uh, help, each, help each other. Um, the, the, the biggest headache has been organizing mini exhibits at something like 35 museums around the world, all meant to be opening today. <laughs> At least the Hearst Museum one is open today. Um, and uh, on Friday I was in the Bishop Museum and we were installing the exhibit there. And then I'm going on from here to Harvard where they're opening on the 4th, I think. So. Um, and the idea for each museum was just to, to do a single case, but to tell a story which contributes to the history of Pacific archaeology from their perspective. Now if you went to any museum in the world and you said, let's have a giant exhibition on the history of Pacific archaeology, they'd go like, uh, you know, like get out of here. But if you say, just give us a case, come on guys, you know, it can't, it can't, be, that, it can't be that hard, um, then they will actually come to the party, including the British Museum, whose uh, I think their exhibit is opening today or tomorrow. Um, Anyway, it was a complete nightmare dealing with all these museums. I, not, I, I exclude, of course, the Hearst Museum, which it was a joy to work with them, but some of the museums are really difficult. Other museums, you know, they're like, yeah, fine, 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 and then that person leaves, and the next person comes and goes, I don't know anything about it, I'm not interested. Um, or people are all keen and keen and keen, and then they just stop answering emails. And one of them stopped answering emails, but then I, I thought, 
I wonder if, you know, are they still in this or not? So I sent an email to the guy last week, and to my amazement, he got back to me and he said, no, absolutely, we're meant to be installed on the you know, 2nd of March, but the exhibitions people say, can't do it till the 12th, but it's all happening. But this is someone who's refused to answer a single email from me for the last six months. Yeah, so, uh, so that's why I don't actually know how many museums are putting on exhibits, but I'm sort of going to be traveling around the world to find out. Um, Okay, and uh, oh yeah, then there's a final party, so that'll be, should be exciting. Now, um, this is great, Bishop Museum, uh, there's Gillian Swift and myself, and uh, the subject there of their exhibit is John F.G. Stokes and early Hawaiian archaeology. Stokes did the first recognisable, um, recognisably scientific excavation in 1913 on the island of Kahualawe, and so we've got a small uh, exhibit about him and fish hooks and other artifacts that were found there. And as I said, they, these are various places where, um, where these exhibits are happening and there may even be more countries where they're happening. Um, but that was, uh, it was great to be there and see it set up from like there being a, you know, a gap against the wall to people coming in and they, uh, um, it was wonderful. So that was Friday. Um, and then today, <laughs> I got this. Um, one of our exhibitions is of Lapita pottery from Watam Island that was sent by Father Meyer, who's one of the first discoverers of Lapita pottery, the earliest uh, pottery in the Pacific. And he found it on Watam Island off um, New Britain in Papua New Guinea. And uh, so we arranged for an exhibit at the Melbourne Museum, or Museum Victoria, as it's uh, also known. And um, I wanted to try and contact the Watam Island community who were like, you know, this is a little island in the middle of nowhere. It's very hard to get hold of people. But just the other week, I found the man who can do it. And his name is Kepis Pound, and he's a businessman. But he goes backwards and forwards from Port Moresby, where they actually do have good internet connections and stuff, uh, to Watton. And I asked him to kind of, uh, yeah, I asked him to explain, yeah, we're going to have this little exhibition. It's 26 shirts or something. Um, and, yeah, what are people on Watton think about it? Are they interested? And in fact they were and then they, he, uh, this is, this would be yesterday or on Sunday, so other side of the date line, so I guess two days ago, um, and he held a meeting after church in the church and, and right where this church is, is on top of the Lapita site of uh, Watam at Rakival. Um, and uh, so they got the statement saying they look forward to future collaboration with the Melbourne Museum, Papua New Guinea Museum, and other hosts of evidence of Lapita culture and revealing more knowledge about it. Uh, and a whole bunch of photos of people taken on Sunday in, in Watam at the place where Lapita pottery was found in 1909. So that was a rather nice thing. And then this very morning, <laughs> This picture was taken at uh, 10 o'clock this morning. This is the exhibit in that sort of first room where you enter the Hearst Museum. Uh, and this is about uh, a collection of, I'll talk about it a bit more in a minute, a collection of Lapita pottery um, that you have here um, that was sent, it wasn't found by Gifford during his 1947 expedition to Fiji, but it was sent to him by uh, two people, Lindsay Verrier, uh, a local doctor, and Ratu Rambithi Longavatu, who, who is really the subject of, of, uh, of the talk today. Um, now, Edwin Delilah Gifford, Edward Gifford, of course, the, uh, the uh, director or curator, or whatever he was called, of, the, uh, of the, what is now the Hearst Museum, and, uh, and his wife Delilah, who was a conchologist, a shell person of some renown. And, um, and uh, yeah, he did this expedition to Fiji in 1947, and these collections and field notes and everything are here in the museum. Um, I would uh, uh, acknowledge, and I think I've spelt her surname right, I think it's S-O-N, uh, Maureen Fredrickson, who's the granddaughter of, um, of uh, Edward and Delilah, and uh, she gave me uh, this f lovely photo of them, about to set off. They're about to get on the, the boat to to, uh, to sail to Fiji in 1947. Now Gifford published his monograph, Archaeological Excavations in Fiji, and uh, I won't read it out, but as Pat Coach said, it's, uh, this was a kind of pioneering piece of work. It was the first major piece of field work in the Pacific 
uh, after World War II. And uh, he did uh, look at two very interesting sites, Navatu and Wunder, um, excavated them. And then, as I said, by the time his monograph came out in 1951, he had received this small collection of Lapita pottery uh, there. But the point that I made in the, uh, in the article that I wrote about covert control was that really, and I don't think Gifford was aware of this, but I also don't think he would have minded at all. His whole expedition was really being directed towards certain ends by um, Ratu Salala Sukuna, who was the major Fijian political figure of the time. And it related to these two sites, Navatu and Vunda, which are both very important within oral traditions of the origins of the Fijians. And they're spread across the main island of Viti Levu. Um, and Sukuna clearly thought that perhaps Gifford could tell him something about sort out the land disputes or something. Well, of course, as we all know, archaeology can't actually do that. And uh, Sukuna, I think, quite quickly lost interest. And when his annual report of the Fijian administration came out in, you know, for 1947, you know, it doesn't mention Gifford's work at all, although his administration provided tremendous help to, uh, to Gifford. But uh, so he mentions uh, Salala Sukuna, his deputy in the Fijian administration, George Kingsley Roth, who was a notable anthropologist of Fiji and uh, son of uh, Ling Roth, H. Ling Roth. Um, but also here, Ratu Rambithi Vu Kandavu Longavatu, an educated young Fijian of chiefly rank. And he was uh, ostensibly put in as the assistant of Edward Gifford, but was also very much the eyes and ears of the Fijian administration to sort of keep an eye on him, make sure he didn't kind of screw up. And um, also that he, that he didn't do things he shouldn't be doing. Um, and also he was of chiefly rank. And so he, you know, Gifford kind of sees him as just, oh, you know, they've got this young Fijian who's going to kind of help me out. But he was clearly much more than that, um, given his chiefly status. Now, Ratu Suala Sukuna was a truly amazing character in Pacific history. Um, he was uh, the first Fijian to go to university, he went to Wadham College, Oxford, just before World War I. It's very interesting that no other Fijian went to university until after World War II, and that was only because of the sponsorship of certain European uh, residents of Fiji who paid for scholarships. So Ratu Salala Sukuna, he was very happy that he was the only educated Fijian. <laughs> he also was not allowed to join the British Army because he was black uh, in World War I, so he hopped over to France join the, uh, the French army, or well, probably the Foreign Legion, I guess it was. Would have been the Foreign Legion. And he won the Médaille uh, Militaire, which is equivalent uh, for whatever it was that he did to the Victoria Cross, the highest military honor you can get in Britain. Um, so he was a truly amazing character. He clearly, really, he was like the king of Fiji. I mean, you had governors, but they all, took notice of what he said. And in 1944, he set up this amazing governmental system in Fiji where basically the colonial officers who'd been kind of running the place were told to butt out. And f native Fijians were ruled by the Fijian administration of which he was the head. And it had its own staff. So it was a government within a government. And this system carried on until, essentially until um, independence of Fiji in, I think, 1970. Um, so it really was a, a quite, it wasn't your average colony with the, you know, all the, the um, Europeans in charge. Um, a quote from Derek Scar's uh, uh, book about him, he was just below God and the King with only the governor intervening. As one who dealt authoritatively with land, he was practically a God himself. Um, so Ratu Sukuna, there's a Sukuna park in the middle of Suva and all this sort of stuff. Um, incredible character. I won't read this out, but um, yeah, he was, uh, he had very high chiefly, um, chiefly rank. Um, as I said, he'd won this uh, medal in World War I. Uh, and yeah, really a unique figure in, in, in Fiji. And very supportive of Gifford's expedition for the reasons that I said. Um, also, Gifford published another book 
University of California again, tribes of VT level in their origin places that was essentially a gazetteer of information collected by members of the Fijian administration. And it's interesting that Sukuna wanted to have this information published by a university professor, even though all of the information in there was given by his own staff. But I think he thought that an academic imprimatur would give more power to the statements that were in it, um, which relate to tribes in relation to land. So again, this is more covert control by the Fijian administration of Gifford's, uh, Gifford's work. Um, his deputy was George Kingsley Roth. Um, and uh, the complaint, and I think it's about Roth, of later sort of commissions of inquiry into the colony of Fiji and the processes of decolonization sort of said, you know, the, the white men working for the administration are more Fijian than the Fijians. You know, they were sort of complaining they were more on the side of the Fijians. And certainly Kingsley Roth was very much like that. He was rather a long-suffering um, deputy to Lala Sukuna, I, I think. I love this bit with his razor keen sense of efficiency and preoccupation to the nth degree with detail. He was a fine foil to Sukuna's statesmanship, which was an imposing, formidable mixture of the global and the tribal. <laughs> so yeah, you know, you had a hard time working for Ratu Salala Sukuna. Um, a wonderful uh, thing, just before Gifford's going out there, and this is all material from the Bancroft Library, uh, he had some, uh, you know, he got advice from a lot of people, one of whom was Otto, uh, Otto Dagener, um, who was a botanist, and uh, with this wonderful quotation about uh, how he saw the colonial administration working in Fiji. He was there, I think, maybe before the war, I'm not quite sure. Um, I like this, you know, being an American, I can't help being democratic. How times have changed. Eh? <laughs> um, okay, now, Ratu Rambithi Longavatu. Uh, as I said, he's put on um, to assist uh, Gifford, and also really he's, uh, he's, um, he's there as the eyes and ears of the Fijian administration. And he has a lot of roles. He's, he, in the end, he's doing his own excavations in another part of the site than Gifford is doing. So he's directing excavations. He's, he takes many of the photographs of the expedition, and becomes a very keen photographer. Um, and he, uh, he's already trained as part of his training uh, as a surveyor. So he does a lot of the maps. Um, so this is someone who you know, one would really like to know more about because he's quite obviously a key figure in the whole operation. But of course his name isn't appearing on, uh, apart from in the acknowledgements. Also, this is an interesting event. Uh, the actual label, I think, in the, um, uh, in the monograph says, presenting Yangona, that's Carver, uh, to the dead before removing bones from burial number one. In fact, they're putting the bones back not removing them because they had excavated a burial the day before and then the local pastor who was also a chief was possessed by spirits and kind of you know, having fits and things like that so they realized that, that, that this could well be um, to do with the fact they disturbed these bones so they quickly got them all together and buried them back had a ceremony with the Kava, the Yangona uh, and then he, he got instantly better again so the caption was not quite what happened. Um, here's some examples, some 3D drawings that uh, Ratu Rambithi did for, um, uh, for Gifford. Of uh, uh, Some sites Gifford couldn't go to. He was 60 and not in great health. Um, and, uh, and so some of the places he couldn't really get to, but Ratu Rambithi could. Um, this is another particular site that, uh, that uh, Rambithi was able to get details of from one of the chiefs of Raki Raki with whom he was staying. Uh, that's in Gifford's field notes, from, uh, which are in the Hearst Museum. Uh, there was originally going to be an appendix by Ratu Rambithi Longavatu, which would have been a very interesting um, document. And, and this was to do with his trips to various places. He, he climbed Navatu Peak and did drawings of the 
areas of it which had had the village on top before. Um, but this was cut out of the monograph and I haven't been able to figure out why. I presume it was because of, um, you know, the thing was getting too long or it cost too much to print. But I'm trying to, while I'm here, I'm trying to track down um, who made the editorial decision to cut out um, the appendix, which would have been, uh, I think there's only three appendices now, but there originally a planned to be eight. So it wasn't just his that was cut out, which is why I think it's an editorial decision to do with the length of the monograph. Um, but he would have got a lot more recognition had he had an appendix there under his own name, and that's a draft of it. Um, instead, we, we get um, some of, uh, of Rambithi's uh, statements uh, from his appendix that are uh, included in the general text of the monograph. That's the nearest we get. Now, as I said, after um, Gifford left, went back, came back to Berkeley, um, he was, then later on, he was sent uh, a bag of pottery, accession 948, received on the 25th of October 1948, in the museum, and among it was some, Le what we now know to be Lapita pottery, the earliest pottery uh, in the Pacific, and beyond the area marked on the map as near Oceania, the pottery it used by the earliest settlers um, who uh, came out as far as Western Polynesia and whose ancestors, whose descendants then uh, came on to settle places such as Tahiti, Hawaii, uh, Rapa Nui and, and uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand. So um, this is the distribution of it as we know it today, Lapita Pottery. But of course when Gifford f um, receives this little bag of pottery, he can see that the Lapita, what we now know to be Lapita pottery, is different, but he doesn't know, he's got no idea where it fits in the Fijian sequence because he hadn't found anything like it in excavation. He th actually, first of all, he thought it was quite late, but in fact it turned out to be earlier than any of the, the material that he had found. Okay, and where this bag of uh, sherds came from was the Singatoka sand dunes, which are down here um, on the south west coast. Very impressive sand dunes, one of the biggest dune fields I believe, in fact I think it is the biggest dune field on any Pacific island. And continu sand continually shifting and revealing um, pottery, skeletons, other remains, um, many of which are from a time before the sand dunes were there. So originally the coast did not have sand dunes, the sand dunes are actually a result of human induced erosion of the uplands of the Singatoka Valley um, and then the material uh, was, you know, was brought by currents and, and, and blown up to form these dunes uh, within the last 1500 years or so. And the pottery was sent to Gifford by Lindsay Verrier who's a local doctor. At this time Ratu Rambithi had gone back to work and he'd been sent as a provincial scribe to the provincial headquarters uh, in this area and so he was there as was Lindsay Verrier um, and so they went wandering on the sand dunes and they found this pottery that both of them I think noticed was quite different than anything certainly that Rambithi had seen having accompanied Gifford on all of his, all of his work. Um, and uh, in a, another place, I'm trying to work out exactly where they found this pottery there's a strange thing. In the 60s, there's actually been work at the Singatoka dunes almost continuously ever since because the sands are always shifting, new remains come up. A big piece of work was done, I think, around 63, 64, 65 by Lawrence and Helen Burks. And they actually found a piece of pottery that is identical to one of these sherds here. Just one, and I, but from the, from the account that, that Rambithi gives, I don't think it can come from the same place. And I really wonder if Verrier had two pieces of this pot. And in 1963, he thought he'd be a bit mischievous and he dropped it where the Burkses were digging because I really cannot see that this is the same site. 
but it's it's there's no doubt it's the same from the same part. So there's a there's a mystery there that uh, whether we'll ever sort it out. Now these are the Lapita shirts, and and the, bit, the the piece of pottery that the Burks has found is exactly like this. But this is here. I've seen it. It's in the museum. In fact, it's on display. And these are both dentate dentate stamped Lapita shirts. Um, and the important thing about them, I mean, just a couple of shirts, two, three or four or something, um, is that they, from discoveries that were made after Gifford had done his work, discoveries in New Caledonia, Gifford realised that this looked very much like pottery that was found, published in 1948 on the, from the Ile des Pins, which is an island just off the New Caledonian mainland. Related to, the, to that, he also remembered that in 1921, he had been working in Tonga as an anthropologist then, collecting oral traditions, with McKern, McKern of the Midwest Taxonomic System, isn't it called? Is that McKern? I think it is. Anyway, it's the same guy, W.C. McKern. And McKern had found pottery in Tonga, the first pottery ever found in Polynesia. And of course, it was, the sa it was Lupita. And so, Gifford in 51, when he publishes, he says, says, I don't know what this stuff is, but it looks like the stuff in Tonga, and it looks like this stuff they've just found in New Caledonia. Well, of course, nobody was using any radiocarbon dating at the time, so he couldn't relate any of these. And of course, the, the shirts that he found were just from a surface blowout, so there was no dating associated with them. Um, but then by 53, he's gone to New Caledonia on his next expedition, and he is excavated at the site of Lapita, which gave the name later to Lapita Pottery. And he could see that the stuff he found at, at the site of Lapita, which he mainly called Site 13, um, was again the same style. And by then he had also realized, because he'd been told by, by Father Aurélie, who was, despite his name, was a Frenchman, um, obviously descended from Irish, uh, Irish uh, settlers, uh, and Jacques Avias had already seen the connection between the Ile des Pinchers and those from Wattam Island, where our friends just sent the nice statement from that you saw earlier on. So this is when really the idea that there's this very widespread um, what Jack Golson later in 1961 called a community of culture, bridging the, the divide between Melanesia and Polynesia. And that was Lapita pottery. So the distribution of the Lapita culture really became known through this work. Um, Ratu Rambithi, I won't read out his whole history, but I found his uh, employment file in the Fijian archives. And uh, uh, he was, uh, he, uh, later became a, um, uh, in charge of, a, of, a, of an entire province uh, until um, sadly about 1967 he had a very terrible um, car smash and had to then retire but he in fact lived until I think 2005 um, and uh, because I, we wanted to have an exhibition uh, in the Fiji Museum, the exhibition that's opening today. I know it's actually opening today in the Fiji Museum, I'm not there, but um, the exhibition there was going to be about, or is about, Ratu Rambithi, who also features here because he and Verrier are the ones who found the Lapita pottery. So this picture of him um, is, uh, is also in the exhibit here. Um, Ratu Rambithi and a guy called Aubrey Park, who was a British colonial officer who went to Fiji in 1951, but was a trained archaeologist. Um, so the exhibition in Fiji is about Rambithian Park, both at times employed by the Fijian administration, which means the Fijian native administration, as opposed to the colonial administration. And I thought, I better get in touch, see if I can find any of the family, because it would be a bit unfortunate if they didn't know about it and they wandered into the museum, you know, why, well, they got these pictures of my grandfather or something. So I started making inquiries to try and find out what happened to Rambithi. We knew that he had his first daughter he called Delilah after Delilah Gifford and his second son he called Gifford. <laughs> so in 
So I thought, oh, are these people still alive or what? Anyway, after, with great help from the uh, Opeta Alafaya, the, the, uh, the archivist uh, at the Fiji archives, I eventually tracked them down on my last trip there, last October. And um, just, uh, so there's a picture of Ratu Rambithi. Um, now on the left, uh, uh, child there is, is Rambithi Gifford. Um, and then the, uh, the girl in the middle is Delilah. And then uh, Emery Longavatu was the eldest son named after, um, not Kenneth Emery, I'm so, sorry to say, but after, um, after uh, Ratu Rambithi's father. And here's an amazing photo that the family later gave me, which shows Ratu Rambithi and his wife uh, Vasimatha at the ball for Queen Elizabeth II when she visited Fiji in 1954. So again, you go, this guy's a fairly low-level Fijian administration provincial scribe. How come he's getting invited to the, you know, these things? Because he had this chiefly rank. He had a whole other thing going for him. Anyway, I can, I'm very happy to report that I did track them down. And this is um, the second daughter, uh, Bulu Salata. This is uh, Lavinia, who's the wife of Ratu Rambithi Gifford Longavatu. And when uh, it was uh, Bulu Salata who took me to, I, I don't think she, they, the family get together very often, because first of all, she got the wrong house. We were kind of like, went up the wrong driveway. Anyway, very steep driveway, and, and she goes up there. I thought, I'd wait outside the gates. You know, you can't just walk into somebody's house in Fiji. And then I saw this guy coming down the steep driveway, and I said to him, are you Gifford? And the guy kind of you know, freaks out. And he goes, like, yeah, no one knows I'm called Gifford. And then I said to him, do you know why you're called Gifford? And he goes, not really. He said, yeah, my father said uh, yeah, that, that Delilah, my sister and I, were named after some American friends of theirs. And I said, do I have a story to tell you guys? <laughs> And uh, so, uh, yeah, and then, and then uh, that night we went to um, uh, another son, uh, Seneko Nakuru. Get, um, Ratu Rambithi married twice, so he had his first family had five children, I think had four with the, his second wife. Um, and uh, the first person I actually met was Seneko, who's in the army. And uh, he put me on to Bulu Salata, we phoned her up, I spoke to her, and then that, then she took us to meet Gifford. And none of them had any idea that their father had ever been involved in archaeology. And first of all, they were like Seneca when I met him at the archives. He came to the archives to meet me. He was like, are you sure you're talking about my father? You know? <laughs> and they had no idea. And then I'm talking about and I said, you guys ever heard of Lapita Pottery? And they go, yeah, of course. You know, we're not idiots. Of course we've heard of Lapita Pottery. I said, well, your father found the first Lapita in Fiji. And they're going like, get out of here. <laughs> so it's been a kind of a, a bit of a sort of life-changing <laughs> experience for this family to find out all this stuff. Now, one thing that Gifford did after he left um, Fiji and came back here was he sent a camera to Ratu Rambithi because he could see the guy was really interested in photography. Two of Rambithi's sons are professional photographers. So that all started with, with Gifford. Um, so it was just a very nice thing. Just to wind up, the sort of take homes. Um, clearly, uh, Ratu Sukuna kind of had a lot of control over what, well, control over everything that Gifford did when he was in Fiji. Unbeknownst to Gifford, but I know that Gifford wouldn't have been worried about it or felt bad about it. Um, Rambithi was clearly more than just an interpreter and an aide. Um, and uh, also, he and Lindsay Berrier then found the first Lapita pottery, sent it to Gifford, and that's what the display is about in the Hearst Museum. Uh, but Rambithi and Gifford established a lifelong exchange relationship and friendship. And the letters are in the um, Bancroft Library. And they continued corresponding. Gifford's granddaughter, who would be a woman, probably if she's still alive now, because I saw her in 2015, she'd be probably in her 80s, 
And she had met Delilah because Delilah and some of the other children migrated to the States. They were Mormons and they were first in Hawaii and then they've kind of spread out. Um, so she had had, she had met Delilah in Hawaii. She'd gone on a cruise to Fiji and tried to reconnect with the, fa the Gifford family to Ratu Rambithi. And just the last day they were there, um, that uh, she kind of they managed to get hold of him, but it was too late and they were, the cruise ship was leaving the next day or something. So I kind of feel that I've re-established the link between the archaeologists and Berkeley and the Ratu Rambithi's family. And also, I think what it shows is when there is good documentation, it is possible to recoup the contributions and agency of indigenous interlocutors and collaborators. It's often hard, but in this case, it was possible to do. And there's much more that I hope to do when I see them all again in April when I go back to Fiji. Thank you very much. <laughs>